Chapter 52 The first time I hear it, I'm lying in bed at night. I'm half sleeping, half dreaming, when the sound of the rain wakes me. It takes me a few minutes to realise what it is. It's such a soft sound if you really listen to it, the pitter-patter of rain. But to me, that night, it sounds deadly, terrifying. I pull back the curtains. The sky is clouded over, but it's beginning to get light outside. The rain is falling steadily down onto the green on the ground, onto the swelling blutches below. I try to look down at the bottom of the tower to see if they've started to grow towards us, but I can't make anything out. It all looks blurry through the rain. Pigeon wakes up when I start moving, and I pick up his sleepy body so he hangs over my shoulder. He feels heavy and warm against me. When I put him down, he settles right on top of my legs so I can't move him. In the end, I just pull the covers up over my head and try to block out the sound of the rain and go back to sleep. All I can do is wait for the morning and hope that it's stopped by then. But in the morning, the rain is still falling. The clouds look darker now. They are bigger, more menacing. Puffed up and heavy with the rain they are carrying. I have a feeling of dread in my stomach. I know the rain could stop and we might be alright. I know that people could be coming to rescue us at any time. But I also know that both of those things might not happen. That this could be the end for us now. And there is nothing that Mum or Obi or Dory or Ben or I can do about it. Our tower will fall down and we will be trapped inside it. I walk slowly to Dory's that morning. Pigeon is balancing uncertainly on my shoulder and rubbing his ear against mine now and again. It feels like he's saying, keep going, keep going. There's no one in Dory's flat when I get there. Not a trace of anyone. Not a half-empty cup of tea or a plate of crumbs on the table. Just silence. I know where I'll find them all. I start the long walk down to the lower floors and find the one where I helped Obi pour the salt out of the windows. I can't see anyone there, but there are bags and bags of salt piled up in the corridor. Then a door opens, and Obi comes out from one of the flats, his head wrapped up in scarves. He doesn't see me. He just picks up another bag and goes into another flat. He looks tired. His back is stooped, and his shoulders slump, as if there's a large invisible weight pressing down on him and making him bend. The door slams behind him and echoes loudly down the corridor. Then I hear footsteps on the stairs and I see Ben coming up, carrying more bags of salt. His face is sweaty from climbing the stairs and carrying the bags. He doesn't seem to have time to talk to me properly, but he tells me to go and help downstairs in the basement. Pigeon and I make our way down. Through the lower windows, I can see that more and more blutches have surged up. They have grown taller and thicker, and they are growing so close to one another, it seems like they are trying to push each other out of the way. The rain falls on their glistening bodies, so they look even shinier than before. They look so glassy now, that I think you might be able to see your own reflection if you stand before one. I look away from them, but then a slight movement at the corner of my eye makes me quickly glance back. Have I just imagined it, or do they look bigger than they did just a moment ago? Or are they growing in front of my eyes? They stand tall and proud, and though I can't see them moving again, their stillness seems even more frightening. It's as if they're waiting until I've turned away before they move forward. I know that it's quite impossible, but it is how I feel that morning, as I stand staring at the shiny, sharp tips and engorged, thick bodies. I find Dory and Mum in the basement. They are both kneeling on the ground doing something, but they stand up when they see me and hug me tightly to them. Are you okay, Addy? Dory asks me. We knew this day might come, didn't we? We'll be all right, though. Don't you worry. Your mum and I are spreading salt into all the corners of the walls and around every window. Can you give us a hand? We work all day, pushing the white salt granules into every little crack and corner that we can find in the basement. It takes a long time to do it properly. My fingers feel sore and raw by the afternoon. My hands have turned red and there's still so much to do. Pigeon stays close to us all day, watching us work and looking out of the window. Dory says that he's our lookout.
We don't stop properly to eat that day. All of us just keep going until we get really hungry and then we go off and quickly find something to eat and then carry on working as soon as we finished. I only have time to eat a Snickers bar and some cheese crackers which have turned a little bit soft from being open too long. Dory makes us all stop for dinner that evening though. She lights lots and lots of candles so the room is full of their soft golden light. We eat bowls of sticky rice which has mushrooms in it. It's creamy and easy to swallow. Shame we couldn't have pigeon today folks, Dory says. I ran out of time but I'd been saving this packet of mushrooms for a while now. I notice that Obi doesn't tell Dory off when she opens a large tin of tuna for pigeon. In fact, he hasn't really spoken much today. There are a few moments while we are all sitting eating our food when, if you were looking at us sitting around the table enjoying our dinner, you would not have been able to tell that we are on the very edge of disaster. That while we are pushing forkfuls of soft rice into our mouths, the blutches are creeping around us in a deadly circle ready to eat the stones and bricks of our home. But it doesn't last very long, and as soon as our bowls are half empty, everyone starts talking about what we've done today, and what we should do next. Mum and Dory say that the basement has been salted, so that they will move to the next floor up now. Obi says that the blutchers haven't moved much further today, but as soon as we stop putting salt out, they will come closer. The rain is washing it away as fast as they are laying it, Ben suggests we should keep throwing salt out of the windows through the night in shifts, which everyone thinks is a good idea. Then Obi voices something that everyone is worried about, but no one has said anything about yet. That we haven't got a lot of salt left now. That we are down to the last of the bags. I can find some more, I say. It's the first time I've spoken, and everyone turns to look at me. I know where to look from going to find food all those times. I do, Obi says. That would be brilliant. Suddenly, it seems as if there isn't enough time to finish our dinner. There is far too much to do. The night coming is no reason to rest. We leave our half-eaten bowls on the table, our forks still resting in them, and get back to work. Pigeon won't need his food, though. He protests so much when I pick him up that we leave him in Dory's flat. The rain has continued to fall heavily all day and shows no sign of stopping as darkness falls around us. It's just like the time when the blutchers first showed up, when the first buildings tumbled. The rain which never stopped falling, which started it all. We all have to work by torchlight now. Mum, Obi, Dory and Ben go downstairs to continue the salting. But I go to the upstairs flats to look for salt. I haven't been out and about in the tower when it's so dark before. Without Pigeon wrapping his furry body around my legs or perching on my shoulder, I feel something that's a little bit like being afraid mixed with the quiet of being alone. And things look different in the dark. They look like they could be something else entirely. My mind is bubbling away with ideas of what things could be. But I keep returning to the same image of tangled bodies of blutches stretching out slowly towards me. I know I won't be any help to the others if I keep thinking about these things. So I try to concentrate on them instead. I think about Dory's wrinkled, serious face when she's playing cards and how Obi's body always sags when he's sad about something so I can always tell. I think about Ben telling me how he'd never forgive himself for his wife dying with trails of tears running down his face. I think about Pigeon's thin grey body leaping from the exploding blutches and into my arms. I think about Mum's face lit up by candlelight as she sits quietly with us eating dinner and then reaching across the table to ruffle my hair with a smile. And I think about Gaia too. I think, I want to see her again. And I think, I wish I'd had the chance to say goodbye. If it doesn't stop raining, and we don't find enough salt, all of these things will be lost. They will just vanish, into the air, and no one will ever know about them. No, that's not quite right. They will be crushed. Devoured by blutchers. If someone comes to look for us in a few days' time, they won't even be able to find where our tower once stood. It will just be covered in clumps of glowing, hungry blutchers, growing taller and more tangled. I give my head a shake, because I realise now 
it's far too important to try and save them. I don't waste any more time being scared of things that aren't there and that my mind is just trying to make up to scare me with. I fling open front doors and cupboard doors and find every little bit of salt that I can. Sometimes I'm lucky and find clear plastic bags full of salt or largish bottles of table salt. Other times I only find little glass salt shakers which are half empty. It doesn't matter though, you need every little bit, every last grain. I make piles of what I find on each floor in the corridor by the stairs so the others can come and take it when we need it. And I work my way down the tower, floor by floor, flat by flat, shaker by salt cellar. When I reach my own flat, I stop to sit down. I think, Mum hasn't come back. They must still be working. I should go down and find them. But the flat is so still and quiet, apart from the non-stop dripping of the rain falling outside that it makes me want to be still and quiet for a minute, so I just sit there. I don't mean to lie down or close my eyes, but I feel a great weariness take over me. It feels just like a wave going over my head, or as if someone has just pointed a wand at me and said, Sleep. I want to sleep, but I can feel my head pulling me down, but at the same time, I don't want to just yet, as tired as I am. I take up my usual position on my window sill and, in the darkness, look out of my window. I shouldn't be able to see anything, because there aren't any street lights anymore, but I can. As my eyes grow used to the dark, I can see every blotcher, the spiky tops all pointing upwards, drinking up the rain, just like how Gaia used to lift her face to the sky. And the reason I can see them is because they are giving off a little glow. It's not a strong light, it's a bit like the stars that you can stick on your ceiling that glow in the dark. Maybe not even that bright. But this light is enough that by sitting there at my window for a little while, I can see them. What I notice next is stranger still. I realise the trees themselves are giving off a glow too. It's not as bright as the light from the blutchers, but it's there nonetheless. And if I look even closer... I can see the glow coming from the grasses and the bushes and the ground. From all the plants that are not blutchers. They are all connected now. They have become part of the blutchers. And the blutchers have become part of them. It makes my head feel dizzy to see the whole world glowing like that. Because as afraid as I am of the blutchers. And as sad as I am about all the people who have died because of them. Looking at them tonight, I still find them beautiful. And now the trees and the grasses and the bushes are part of that beauty too. A small voice in my head wishes that we could both exist together, that the spores didn't catch in our throats and kill us, and that we lived in wooden houses that they wouldn't feed on. It's a silly thought though, and as soon as I think it, I dismiss it, as if I'm blowing out the candles on a birthday cake.